<laughs> Welcome everyone uh, to Food Biz Plus. Food Biz Plus, the new retail landscape is our topic for today. I am Kathy Joran, the director of the Food Business School of the Culinary Institute of America, based at our Copia campus here in Napa Valley, California. We are um, the executive and graduate division of the CIA, uh, the Culinary Institute of America. We offer executive education courses, these uh, webinar series, as well as a master's degree in food business. Our mission is to enable and empower our students to design, deliver, and lead transformative innovations that address the world's most pressing food systems challenges and what we also think are its greatest business opportunities. As I mentioned, today we're talking about food business in the retail landscape. And I'd like to welcome our special guest, Rook Golden. We'll come on momentarily. Good morning. Thank you, Kathy. Welcome. Thank you, Rook. I'm going to give a brief introduction. Rook Golden is the Vice President of Marketing and Innovation for Organic Food Company, Navitas Organics. In her role, she oversees new product development and brand design and manages a product portfolio of over 60 plant-based superfoods and snacks, such as smoothie ingredients, seeds and nuts, nutrition powders, and energy bars. Her responsibilities include all aspects of the product, including general management, P&L responsibility, quality, consumer response, marketing mix, and retail activation. <laughs> Brooke will be teaching in our CIA Masters in Food Business program in our Consumer Packaged Goods product track. At the end of this presentation, I will talk a little bit about our master's degree, uh, so stay tuned um, at the end of, of my conversation with Brooke, and I'll tell you a little bit about that, that uh, program. During our conversation today with Brooke, we will learn how brands are evolving in the new retail landscape from direct to consumer to the recent acquisition of Whole Foods by Amazon and what all of this means for the definition of how to succeed on the grocery shelf. So um, I'm going to uh, talk with Brooke, give, uh, talk with her by giving her a series of questions that are sort of general to our environment. I've incorporated a number of the questions that those of you who are registered have sent in in advance. You can also see that you can uh, send in questions, type in questions under our chat area as we go along in case something else comes up that you'd like to know about. And we'll address as much as we possibly can in the next 45 minutes or so. So Brooke, let's start by having you tell us a little bit more about your background and your extensive experience in marketing food products. Yeah, thank you for that great introduction. So helpful. Um, and when your job gets broken down into bullet points, it quickly becomes, uh, you look at it in a different way. But yes, I have been working with food for probably the last 20 years now. And I um, started out of, I think, when we talk about uh, experience bringing brands to market and retail. My even first role out of college was in an advertising company and really um, learned some of the basics of both communication and product positioning from the get-go. Um, from there, my career evolved and I had the um, pleasure of spending eight years at Cliff Bar and Company and through some of their growth. And at the time that I was there, we went from just shy of 100 million to almost uh, half a billion, so $500 million growth period. So really got to see what uh, happens with a, both a brand, a company, and a product through a life cycle. And in that um, particular period, an extreme category explosion, um, and really learned a lot both about natural food, but product and, you know, some really amazing brand pillars and business principles. And then uh, during that time, I also got my MBA at uh, Haas School of Business right there in Berkeley and really solidified just kind of my executive thinking and business acumen and joined Invitas Organics in now five years ago. And at the time started in marketing, um, but as a small company really ended up and the only marketing hire building a whole team um, around product, marketing, innovation. Uh, in a small company, marketing is a misnomer because it actually can entail everything from operations to legality, to sales strategy, 
uh, when you're talking about a product because you, um, as a product champion and a consumer champion, you actually do need to touch all aspects of the business to, to have a product succeed. So I've launched, I would say it's probably around over 50 products um, in that time in the last 20 years, uh, some brand extension, some new categories, uh, and every every project has been you know uniquely different in what uh, both has happened bringing it to life as well as how it succeeded on shelf. So I'm excited to share some of those kernels of insight uh, with the team, with all of you today. Thank you. We're so appreciative of you sharing your experience. It's very extensive and Yeah, it's a great, it's, a, you know, uh, it's constantly evolving and it uh, is continuing to evolve. I think when we look the furthest, it's interesting, the cycles, right, that it's taken when we look at the retail landscape, it's how are people interacting with products and where they find them. And, you know, originally our our culture, uh, and it's different in many cultures, but here we started with actually specialty stores, right? So there was a meat shop and a dairy shop, and then that was consolidated into grocery, and then grocery um, kind of evolved back to specialty with some of the advent of the Whole Foods and natural food stores uh, gaining popularity and distribution. And then in the last, I would say in the last five years, we've really seen a pretty aggressive, well, five to 10 shift in, when we think of food retailers, that aggregation. So having a lot of, um, you know, Amazon buying Whole Foods, Safeway and Albertsons merger, a lot of even those regional grocery chains that um, if you have users from like Midwest chains being uh, consolidated or dissolving, be, uh, even, you know, CVS trying to find store within a store models at Target, also looking at the you know the importance of mass and mass being um, you know targets Walmart's their food presence right Target used to sell food now it's a really big part of their store footprint and as they evolve into more and more stores and expansion they're trying to figure out how and where food plays a role in their footprint the same and then also retailers looking at how they're going to compete with Amazon and the kind of online food, um, whether that's produce, whether that's shelf stable product, but trying to find solutions for that as we as consumers expect more convenience, expect more quality. And frankly, the pricing models are very much affected by the, um, the like transparency of pricing that has happened with the online evolution and some of these larger um, acquisitions and retail power then of what they're garnering for prices, whether that's also Amazon as much as um, Costco being, you know, coming on board and having a really strong, and in my case, commitment to organic foods has really, you know, changed the kind of playing field. And, and there are a lot of brands who launch just at Costco and are multi-million dollar businesses. So I think um, when we think of the the different players in the evolution, it's it's changing, but just in that little synopsis, right, you can see where the different darlings have been quick blips and then quickly evolved of, um, you know, Target trying to figure out how they're going to compete with Amazon now when they were the darling of retail just 10 years ago and being held as the case study of success. Um, so it's, it's an interesting space to watch. Yes, most definitely. And it's definitely uh, evolving as, as you say, as we all want convenience, we all want uh, one-stop shopping or delivery or whatever it may be mm -hmm. to, to fit our, our busy lifestyles, right? Yeah. Is, is there, are there other distinctions that you uh, want to make between those different types of, of stores or? Yeah, I think it's the, uh, um, and as we get into it, the, uh, when we think of the different retailer, I think there's, you know, probably products and positioning. I, um, when we're thinking of our audience here, and I know uh, from some of the pre-comments, some of the people, like you mentioned, have their own products they want to bring to the market, and they're thinking about um, how 
how to do that and what does retail mean for them. I think when you look at all, you know, any of the lists that I just mentioned, um, from a Whole Foods to a Target to a Costco, um, I think being strategic. So you, every product might not be for every retailer. Uh, you might not know that, and it might be just let me go where I can get in, and it's a lucky break given a relationship you have or a meeting you have of where you end up on shelf. There are also a lot of, um, I'm seeing an increase in these kind of specialty gourmet brands. We just came off of the fancy food show earlier this week where we see a lot of you know niche brands uh, trying to get in, and these are, when we think of that, those retailers are like the Dean and DeLuca or the kind of you know high-end uh stores in, you know, urban markets that are charging, you know, premium for specialty barbecue sauce or these, you know, the beautiful chocolates uh, and caramels or gift shop type places. There is, um, an, I feel, a never ending opportunity in those shops because they're always really looking for beautiful gourmet products. But so I use that as an example, because if you do have this uh, caramel recipe that's been in your family for generations that is, you know, unmatched by anything you've ever seen on retail, then thinking about it as, okay, well, then my spot might, it's probably not Target where I'm going to have to compete with conventional products that are, you know, five cents per, you know, to the dollar per, per gram or whatever. It's a price game there um, because they want volume. But can I be in a couple local or a few regional specialty shops? But then, then you have to say, okay, if that's the case, then I'm looking at my packaging really matters Packaging always matters, but in that example, it's like it really matters because it's about how beautiful you appear on shelf in addition to how good your product is. So thinking about your retailer as part of your part of your product proposition can I think increase your likelihood to success and it's part of your you know strategy selling in. The other you know size is a and distribution. So if you do go into Target and you get sold in, you know, then you're expected to be in. 300 stores overnight. How are you going to do that? And they target works direct whole foods only works for distributor distributor is going to take uh, 40% of your margin right off the top. So it's a, it's thinking about how you're set up and what you're able to do and thinking about that, I think ahead of time when you're going into both build your business as well as meet with a retailer and knowing, you know, what lens they're looking through. Um, Costco wants to be the best, quality value proposition. So they're going to go in and, you know, certainly they have done their homework um, of what other product, what other similar products are available to them. How are you going to be able to, you know, either could be a regional play, which they do buy things in regionally. Um, their warehouses also do a tremendous amount of, of volume and they care a lot about your manufacturing practices and being prepared to show that right up front. So every retailer probably has a, um, sheet of, they don't, I mean, I've not seen these sheets. I'm saying theoretically a kind of a punch list of what their expectation is just to pass go. Um, some of these relationships, especially to retailer, you can probably go in one-on-one -on -one as a relationship. These bigger retailers, Target, Costco, um, even Whole Foods to some, ex to some extent, you need brokers who own those kind of relationships and it's them introducing you to those retailers that helps you get in the space. So, they, they all are different and it's not one, every shelf is not created equal, right? It's not just, um, I have a product, I can get it on any shelf. It's like you really do kind of map out um, just like a globe if you're planning a trip, like where do I want to go and then how am I going to get there? And it might take different tools to get into any one of those locations. Right. And also people need to determine what exactly are they trying to get out of a business of selling a product? You know, is it is it truly a hobby and they don't need to really make a living off of it? Is it something where they really want it to be their primary income? Do they want to grow the business? You know, at what you know size level might they want to be would, would also play into that. It's a great point, yeah. When you're talking about these parameters that these different retailers have for getting into their businesses, are those, is that information available to somebody who's researching these kind of? Yeah. Potential opportunities. I think if you um, not really available as like I mentioned, like, oh, it's a punch list. Um, I think you can. The Internet is a, an amazing tool. If you uh, wanted to get into Kroger, uh, their new CEO uh, has, you know, he's a pretty public personality. 
think, and because it's more of a public company, you can go in and get a lot of information, a lot of articles written about what they're prioritizing target. Similarly, get a bit, little bit of a sense, but really when you're trying to get into any of these stores, you're looking at, you're meeting with one person whose job is to manage a series of shelves and in, in their store. So if you were a dairy buyer, um, so each set, each store is broken into call it like probably 20 to 50 micro universes. And there's a person who is in charge of that micro universe, deli meats or any like cereals, right? Uh, water. Um, there's a person who just their job every day is to go in and make sure that those shelves in their store uh, nationally or wherever their stores are, are performing and giving the best return on investment for their company. So if you know that going in, it's like you could go on LinkedIn, find that person, um, search some articles about them. They may be kind of a more of a public speaker voice around it. Certainly from that retailer learning about, you know, you can pretty quickly find some information about store growth or where they're finding growth or what they've come out with, what they're interested in, you know, target for their made to matter program, which is now extinct. But for a while that was a big piece of what they were looking for. So in that time, you would always go in with a conversation around your, you know, company values and how you may or may not be a fit with that program or, and if you weren't in the program, just because you knew that that was how target was looking at the lens of where they were headed. They've now shifted and it sh changes probably, it seems like every six to 12 months that they change their priorities a bit. Um, but really it's knowing your business no matter what and the landscape, right? So if you have a product of any kind, you're coming out, you'll want to know the story of why your product is different, but also that you've done some homework about your competitors or the environment or the retailer you know, that you're priced competitively or not. And if you have a premium, why is it a premium? And what are they getting for that premium? Um, if it's the product is that much differentiated, if, um, you know, really being clear about that point and why you think the category that you're pitching or going into is trendy, why it's trending up and why it will be successful for the company and the retailer to keep investing in. So, um, I think the emphasis that can change from retailer to retailer is like where you put the volume in your story. The good news is if you go into any situation like that with a pretty solid business case and you know your information, you can speak to where there's energy in a room. And, and you know, face-to-face -face meeting with those big retailers is a is a big luxury that most brands, you know, might not ever even get the opportunity to do. It's more than often than not just a paper submission and product in a box and you hope they gets their attention and they give you a call to meet or find out more. Um, but they do have a thing. Uh, it's kind of the large retailers category reviews. So they have published calendars who they say like, we're going to be reviewing supplements or, you know, teas this time of year. We have a three week window. You have this three week window to get us the information then we'll make, we have a month to review everything and make a decision. We'll let you know. And then, those decisions will take effect six months later. So even now we're submitting things um, for some major retailers that even if we, I mean, when we do get accepted, fingers crossed, that wouldn't be on the shelf until, um, you know, July or August of next year. Right, right. So based on um, what you've just said, let's jump for a second to, and uh, say how, how, what's the difference between getting into a store and getting on the shelf and then being successful once you're on the shelf? Yeah, I think a lot of people, it's easy to think success is getting in the store because it is, um, it can seem like the largest hurdle. And I've, you know, been a part of and seen a lot of brands who get a, even a lot of splash getting into store and getting accepted and then quickly fall off the shelf or are discontinued. So I think that the it's, sight of the fact that getting on shelf isn't it's just the beginning right so you getting on shelf the the focus is differentiation how you know why should the retailer invest in you that's a retailer conversation so I maybe you have some consumer insight or trend insight or you know there's a many ambassadors who've said that your product will change their life and you bring that to the table to convince them that you're something that they want to invest in and get them out there. 
So that's a, a huge success and kudos to anybody who can who is getting into the right retail space. Once you're on the retail space, it's not that's that's why I say it's just the beginning because you could put a product on shelf, but if a consumer is walking through a grocery store or a retail store or a beauty shop, whatever your product might be, you have to get their attention. Um, and that's harder and harder to do. I think, you know, historically it was like, oh, you advertise on TV and you advertise in print and they've seen your brand. So then they'll recognize it when they happen to walk by the shelf. But when you think of happening to walk by the shelf, that's a lot of odds that you're taking. They're going to like stumble across your product. So I think it's understanding the, again, from the retailer perspective, what do you know about their consumer? Some retailers have great marketing programs built in. So you can say, hey, I want to be in your digital coupon book. I want to be in your flyer. Those can be very expensive, you know, $25,000, $100,000 um, propositions. When you think of like the target flyer looks so good. Those that they didn't just like pick you because you're cute. They picked you because you paid a lot of money to be in that circular and you hope that it's going to be a good return on investment. In many cases it is, but it's marketing for that. So, right. You can't it's just like, Oh, I get the product and I'm going to be able to give this many jars of jam to this retailer in different retailers. The bigger the retailer, the more money you have to spend for it to succeed on shelf because they have probably have a larger footprint that you're trying to get to penetrate some attention to your particular slot in that store. Um, you know, and then just like the retail ev evolution of different footprints, certainly the way people are marketing is evolving, right? So we have a lot of uh, in, you know, social media advertising, a lot of paid advertising on digital now, much more than print and television, um, using ambassadors for everything from product reviews to PR that, you know, it's no longer really setting, you know, going to see the publishers of some of the hot magazines um, that are controlling the the share of public voice. It's actually these insiders, uh, through, you know, influencers that are Instagram follower, a crazy Instagram following who are actually or um, endorsing product through their social feeds or through other um, kind of like more lifestyle approaches that are getting more attention and kind of more return on investment dollars. Um, so I think coupons, public relations, um, sampling, you know, whatever your product lends itself to, uh, and different products might lend themselves to different things, but needs a lot of education. Like people don't understand it. Then how are you educating about that product on your website, in store, doing demos, you know, having people in the store sampling your product, being at events. Um, and then where, you know, you always have a finite number of dollars for kind of a marketing and education spend, where do you think it's going to yield you the best return on investment, but certainly budgeting for that, because I think it's easy to just like, I have a product and here's the price. Um, and if you're not fostering it with some kind of fuel of awareness, uh, you might get onto the shelf, but it might, you might not be there long. And, and retailers have a really short, um, tolerance for, you know, we call it, you know, your velocity, which is your rate that you're turning on shelf. If your velocities aren't performing, you're quickly going to be off the shelf and the next time they reset. And there's not a lot, there's, they aren't very forgiving. It's not like, oh, well, I changed it now. Can you take it back? It's like, you kind of get one, one shot and you hope it goes well. Um, and, you know, relationships. So how are you tracking it? If you're on a shelf, are you checking in to know how it's doing, why it might be doing well or not? So you can be nimble and react to whatever might be happening. Like we got on shelf, but people don't know how to open it. Or we got on shelf, but there's only one flavor that people like. Well, then quickly get in and start thinking about what your next flavor is so that you can substitute out the flavor that's not working really quickly rather than just lose that spot when that one gets discontinued. As examples. So yeah. different retailers have different expectations of uh, velocity of movement for a product. And is that pretty much uh, talked about up front when you get a product into a retailer about what their expectations are? It can be. It's not always um, clear because it might depend on your price point. So they, you know, the bar category has pretty clear hurdles um, and velocity rates. So a hurdle meaning if you're selling less than 
six bars per store per week, you're likely that would you're not meeting their hurdle for performance. So you're underperforming, you're going to be on the list for a discontinuation. If you're meeting it. If you're selling more units than that per store per week, you're likely in the green, but they might want to know how you can still, you know, they're always going to want to know how you can do better. Um, so they do have different velocities. Um, as example, you know, um, Whole Foods bar set has a really high velocity expectation, but you could go to a CVS or Rite Aid. Convenience stores have a much lower like expectation because they're just people aren't going there to shop for that product as often, and they're okay with that. <clears throat> What that will give you is a different challenge in your operations because you have products sitting on shelf for a really long time that could likely expire. So then you're managing your inventory becomes the challenge, not your promotion strategy, right? So there's diff – but every retailer does have a different sort of expectation for performance. Um, and some might be like, hey, I just want the whole category to do – well, how are you educating about, in, you know, now at Navitas, like functional nutrition so that maybe my velocities are low, but if I'm driving people to the, the set or that area of their store and amazing grasses velocities are going up a little bit, then I'm showing, well, we've, we've driven people and we've shown them that this area is important, whether or not it's directly to Navitas. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's great. And then... Um, what do you recommend in terms of using specific data to play into success of a retail product? Yeah, I think um, the larger the company, the more data they expect, but data is extremely expensive. So um, these are, you know, the data houses being uh, IRI and Nielsen, the largest spins is the natural uh, market data source. You can buy one off reports um, of your performance. So what those reports will show you in any of those examples are what stores you're in, uh, what's your, how fast you're turning. So I'm selling five units in each store a week. Um, what's my average price? Because you tell a retailer what your retail price is, but anywhere along the chain of distribution or stores putting their tickets out, um, may or may not be in compliance with your price. If you're on promotion, they'll tell you what that promoted price is. Um, and you can buy your data. You can also buy your competitive data. So bigger companies, um, we look at data all the time. We're looking at it for ourselves and our competitive set to understand the health of a product as well as the health of the brand as well as the health of the category, so our competitors. And when we want to see our competitors, you know, how are they doing? Well, they're, they might be on sale 50% of the year at 30% off. Well, that's important for us to know that why our numbers might be down and or um, why we're losing share it, or they might be doing that and still not gaining um, you know, share or sales. So kind of it's, it's a really helpful barometer of which to look at success. But I think... Mm -hmm. Being scrappy about data for certainly on the onset is a, is essential because you can't be a new starting brand and be investing in data to that extent. So if you were working with a broker who's a person right who owns that relationship between the retailer and the products, they might have access to it. Again, there are so many published sources or news industry news that you can scour and pull data for we still we have a lot of data that's you know syndicated that we pay but when we go to do you know every year big new company presentation our associate brand managers are just you know searching googling you know different reports to be like to find sound bites about organic foods or nutrition so using those to tell your story but retailers and the product they speak in terms of data right because they want to again know I'm responsible for this business. How is it going to succeed? So whether you don't have any data and you're starting a brand new category, then your data might just be like millennials love B core and that's growing or millennial, you know, this packaging, or they really are, here's what we know about them. And you're telling that story with some, and millennials happen to be, you know, X percentage of the population and they're growing at this percent. So it's like, 
just supporting whatever story you have with a few data points will go a long way in both building credibility and breaking through some of that. So it's, um, it can be very romantic intention and packaging, but I think um, the data goes a long way in solidifying any business case uh, for your product. That makes sense. That makes sense. And speaking of the story, how important is a, a, a story of a company or an individual starting a company and the mission and values of that company to retailers these days? It seems like that's a growing um, popular way of selecting products, especially given the challenges in our industry and our environment. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that's an important piece of getting into a market? Yeah, I think it's a great it's a great question, and I think it is growing. I think um, there are uh, one area of commerce that we haven't totally touched on is this kind of called direct to consumer model. So there are a lot of brands who have started just by having a niche product and putting it online and selling it direct to consumer. Um, some of those examples, right? Casper mattresses, Quib uh, toothbrushes. Is it uh, Dirty Lemon, Glossier, the cosmetics company, uh, Henry's or Harry's, the razor, which are now all have brick and mortar and have evolved. And some of them are even now carried in Target. So they evolved from being a successful direct consumer brand into retailer. And why I'm bringing them up with this particular question is because they all started with this kind of halo of unique positioning, unique product, whether it was around their values or just a commitment to a challenge they were trying to solve and break through the congestion of big box brands and, you know, conglomerates, if you will. Um, I call them sort of like the Instagrammable boutique brands when I think about that look. And it's true. And they're very, some of them are very successful. But what they've all done is had a really clear product proposition and brought it to life to their consumer. And typically it's paired with a founder story that's really passionate or a call it like the David and Goliath type positioning like, hey, this exists in our world and it's big and scary and kind of the bad guy. So we've here we have this like really cool um, like rogue solution, right? So then you feel like you're supporting the underdog. And then the B core, which Navitas is, um, right? These like values driven organizations, or we talk about the triple bottom line are growing every day. And um, I think I think we'll continue to see consumers leaning towards it. When you ask consumers if they want that, they all choose say, yes, I want that. There's a little gray in the research that would suggest like they say that, but then when they go to the shelf, they buy for the lowest price. So I think, it's, I think you, it helps to have it. It's definitely a story to lean into. When we talk about getting on shelf, it can definitely break through the clutter, get a story in front of, like the romance behind a brand can really go a long way in getting you on shelf and getting your consumer's attention. I think it's probably that getting on shelf, the staying on shelf is and your performance on shelf, I think it's a trickier um, trait to leverage because people do tend to still be like, how do I, how do I use it and what's the price, right? In that half a second, they have to make a retail decision. But it gives you a lot of storytelling and narration and content is so incredibly powerful right now in today's marketplace, no matter what retail you're in, because because of social media, because of the online space, people want content in all forms, whether that's telling your founder story to working with an influencer who is telling their life story through your products, all of which are related to what you're talking about in terms of like the values piece. So I think it's a, um, it's kind of a, people are almost like expecting it now with brands. They want to know like, what's your sourcing? What's your, you know, product ingredient um, promise or, what do you stand for to vet you? Yeah. So it's where it was, it used to be like a nice to have. Um, I think it sounds like you have to have that out there or they're, or they're suspect. Right. You talked uh, briefly about the direct to consumer avenue. And um, do you think that's one of the most significant changes in the current retail environment? 
Yeah, I think it's a really interesting space, and um, I'll be curious to see. Um, I'm watching it really closely. We're doing some work uh, pretty aggressively in that space as well. And the what it does, um, especially when we talk to retailer, right, from a brand perspective is extremely valuable because it this idea of, um, just give you the overview quickly. So the idea is I'm going to um, send it, like, have a website, which we most everyone does, and send my products directly to my consumer. So at the very basics, it's that. What that does is it allows you to have a relationship with a consumer. So you have their address, you have their email, probably have their credit card information. Um, so suddenly you know their habits. I don't know any of that information for my target consumer. So I can't tell them like, you must might be running out of cacao powder or that other product that you bought goes really well with this or because you bought that you might also like this. So the value of that consumer is it's, or that relationship is extremely valuable um, and you're getting all the margin instead of having a 40% margin to your retailer. So not only is it more valuable in terms of how your life cycle value you can get out of them and like knowledge and insight, but also help them work with your brand and products. So you're going to get more out of them over a longer period of time, likely. They're going to be more loyal to you. Um, you're also getting more per transaction. Now, the um, and that's kind of what retailers are trying to figure out also with the whole their you know automated shipping and trying to do more of the Amazon model of retail, which they're all scurrying to figure out. But the other piece I want to mention is just from um, like investors. So when investors are looking at small brands to acquire or merge or what have you, they're putting a lot of importance on this particular piece. Because what it does is it kind of is a good barometer for a brand health, right? If they're coming directly to you and they're buying products from you and you have ownership of a large amount of your consumers, you can, you're almost a retailer. So you can use that for testing new products. You have a really strong point of differentiation, right? So they're less likely to go to a different brand. You're more of a brand than a commodity. I mean, at the end of the day, I think we're all somewhat commodities from a consumer perspective and you're really trying not that's like the least what you don't want to be is a commodity which is I go in there everything looks the same I'm only buying on price so it really is a valuable piece but it's expensive to scale so then what you do then it's really becomes a digital marketing buy so then you're showing up you're advertising online or anywhere you you know how it, typically online um, email marketing all to try to turn impressions into a purchase so the it's a it can be an, a very large output marketing spend to get that return it's you don't have to do it that way but it's that's the way to get kind of like you're basically launching a retail environment um, but then you know that that payout over time will be high because you're you're again owning that relationship with consumers. So you can tell them your story about values. You can send them emails and woo them in a way that you wouldn't be able to um, if you were trying to deal with a retailer because in the retailer you're one of you know thousands of brands trying to reach their same consumer. So you're fighting for that versus owning your own platform for messaging and conversations. Mm -hmm. So definitely something to consider and weigh as, a, as an option. It's a whole different set of logistics, right? It is, in terms yeah. of producing, shipping, or taking orders, collecting payments, all of that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, and there are quite a few 3PL systems or groups who are servicing brands in the space. So you basically would ship them your product and then they become a gateway. So while the consumer experience, they would never know that they're not getting it from your warehouse. Um, but there's it's people who specialize in logistics essentially. So you're like here, here's you know a crate a truck full of our products, um, and then they do all the facilitation of ordering and fulfilling. Nice, right, that's right, right. Um, let's talk just uh, briefly before we go to a few other questions from people about the about product innovation in general, and when someone is thinking about launching a new product. 
do you think it needs to be a whole new product category or is there room for coming up with a variation of something that's already existing in a particular successful form? Um, what do you see being most successful in that area? Yeah, I think that's it's a great question and one that I often ask myself. I think, um, so I know you uh, were able to enjoy the fancy food shows. This is a, one of the larger food shows in, uh, it was here in San Francisco this week, as I mentioned. Um, and it's again, focused on that specialty gourmet stores, but I have been many years and every year I think, do we really need another jam or barbecue sauce? Um, and the answer is yes, uh, the, that we do, which is encouraging, right? It can be discouraging for any little brand who's like, wow, I'm one of 300 sauce companies. Um, but the truth is retailers are there because they do want what's new. They want to know what is fresh. They want they want to keep their store trendy and current and fresh. So the first thing they want to see is what's new. Then they'll ask questions about, you know, why this brand and what's your price and all of the business things we've discussed a little bit. But I don't I don't think it does have to be a new category, a breakthrough revolutionary way of doing business. It's what's your unique angle, whether that's an improved product, an included cleaner ingredient deck, maybe. Um, maybe it's a new way of using something or providing a different form of something that already exists, or maybe it's packaging and your product looks amazing. Um, you can look at Method, right, with their soaps. Like, yes, it was a cleaner ingredient soap, but really what made them is because they invested in the industrial design of these really cool looking pumps and bottles that stood out on shelf and Target loved and took them nationally and they're a very successful company and brand. So it's not right. even always what's in in the product. Um, and I think, you know, we've, it can be harder to do uh, break in and say, oh, it has to be a completely new product and category than an extension of something that's already working, right? So um, we even talk about, we have uh, over 70 products and almost 200 SKUs, meaning different sizes or variations of some of those same products. Um, and we still spend a lot, you know, a lot of money on innovation and investment and, and attention on innovation for new categories and formats. But we also look at what's working. So cow being one of our biggest sellers is like, okay, that's working really well. People are pulling their product. What do we need to do to invest in that? It's probably not taking a whole new like form of chocolate. It might just be having a new size because right. people want it and we're selling it at four ounces and we can sell it at 16 ounces and they'll still buy it. And it's a different consumer because it's, they are the ones who are baking with it and using it, you know, four times a week. And the four ounce size is somebody who's using it once a week or a couple times a month. So, and they both end up doing well. So you're getting incremental growth by investing in what's working with slight variations and might be a faster. And in that particular example, I can tell you is a faster return on investment in our portfolio than launching a whole new SKU and product where we have different buyers or we're trying to break through or the space is just more congested, whatever the example might be. It's not, and you can't predict that certainly, but I think it's not to underestimate what small variations in positioning or sizing or your take on a product and then really having a great story and vision around it can go just as far. Yep. Another example of something I saw with a variation that I think um, is, will be interesting to see that I saw at the show was Kikoman having a soy sauce uh, bottle now that has an, uh, like a vacuum insert so that the it's sealed and air never gets to the soy sauce. Oh, interesting. So it's, it's yeah. never can oxidize. So yeah. It will last longer and stay fresher. And, right. You know, same same product, but a totally different package, which really, I think, will be, you know, a value to some people who, you know, may not use up that sauce. As right. It's as, a great, great example. Case. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of questions that came in earlier from, um, our listeners, one was how does personalized health and the trend of personalized health play into determining what products might succeed? Do you think that's going to be a long lasting influencer or is it really just sort of a fad at this point? I, in my mind, I actually relate that to the direct consumer piece where kind of like from the consumer standpoint, I, I know what I want. I know what's good for me. The truth is that a brand has actually told you that you need that and what's good for you, whether that's like 
there are 10, you know, 10, I'll use like a hair vitamin company that has like all the, you pick your different type of hair and they'll give you a multivitamin packet that's specific to you. But when you actually break it down, you're like 90% of this is all the same. Um, they're doing an amazing job segmenting their market and making you believe that you're getting personalized nutrition and choices. But truthfully, it's, it's more about the personalized marketing than it is about the actual product. So I do, I think it's very relevant and very important. I think it's helping. I think that's a marketing play when you think about your products of being as um, distinct as you can to your consumer about what need you're helping them with and why they're, why they feel special and what special niche you're making for them. Um, we see that with one of our products, you know, maca powder is this adaptogenic root that we sell, and there are brands in the marketplace that sell it for that sell it as red, white, and black, and that it's for four different ailments. Now, I know this product very, very well, and I will tell you that they are actually all exactly the same, except that they may have some a bit of a darker color. But your potatoes, being from like yellow to a russet to slightly pink, there it's like this. It's the same variation. So these are, so I think it's, I'm not sure if I'm exactly answering your question, but I think it is not going to go away. Um, it's also what people expect in their retail experience. They want, you know, the target app would be like, here's the coupons that are relevant to you. Email marketing. It will tell you a lot about what it knows about your data and serve you with messages that are very specific to you. All of your online experience is you know, looking at your habits and serving you content and advertising that's specific to what you your um, journey on the internet has been, right? So brands and companies are only going to get more personal data. We're only going to get more personal experiences back as a result of that. So I think it, it is going to continue, but it's, you know, as anybody launching a brand, it's up to you to tell the story that you want to tell. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. And then uh, I know you said you could talk a lot about this, but maybe a short uh, opinion about the uh, CPD products entering the mainstream or cannabis focused products mm -hmm. entering the mainstream in areas where it's now legal for recreational use. How do you see that as a growth area? Yeah, very big growth area. I, I'm really excited about this space um, and just watching it really closely. Um, and yeah, I was like, we could do that could be, I think that, well, there are, there are like, multi-day conferences on this issue right now. So um, for just a quick overview for not everyone who may understand it. So there's cannabis plant, which um, has THC, which is the part of the plant that we know uh, are most familiar with of creating a high in your experience, whether it's you know, smoke, typically smoked or eating. And um, there are states where that's legal and states where it's not, but federally it's illegal to have cannabis plant and THC. Um, CBD is a part of the both hemp and cannabis plant and the CBD part of the plant comes from the flower um, also and it is um, to not be too scientific but we all have an endocannabinoid system that regulates our hormones and our kind of nervous system and CBD is a receptor that helps just kind of calm your body. It helps with inflammation, it helps some people say it helps with memory, um, inflammation, whether that's for mental or digestive or calming, you know, are all kind of related. Um, so it's this particular element of the plant has really been exciting. Um, it was approved in a drug, uh, Epidiol, uh, by the FDA from the cannabis plant. Then in January, the uh, farm bill passed making agricultural hemp federally legal. And we've sold hemp for many years. It's been the seeds and the plant protein have been legal. Um, but what this did is made the flower part of agricultural hemp also legal, which is where CBD comes from. So now CBD is part of considered part of agricultural hemp, but still it's actually, it's federal. You can't have be federally um, indicted for selling it. Um, but the FDA has not approved it. So you're under, you know, as a food company and or a supplement company under a lot of different regulation. And 
the FDA has said that it can't be included in food products and the state of California, California Public Health has said the same thing. There are a lot of brands selling it <laughs> everywhere. Um, so I think because of the uh, really kind of miraculous benefits of this particular plant, it's going to be showing up and is showing up all over. Um, it's sold in a lot of retailers, CBD, I think any brand who's in that space has a really uh, important job around education and helping consumers understand it. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll see it certainly as a commodity and input, the pricing is inevitably going to be all over the map for the next five years as uh, supply tries to catch up with demand as brands start to use it and national brands start to use it. Um, I think I, I differentiate that in terms of CBD and hemp because that'll be more mainstream and accessible the whole conversation around you know cannabis and THC which the CBD also plays a role in that conversation is a little bit of a different space because that then is only it's either it's really monitored by dispensaries because even in states where it's legal you can't buy THC it's like an alcohol license so you can't buy THC products in a convenience store or a grocery store um, in Colorado you actually have to have THC in your product to sell it at a dispensary. You can't have a CBD only product. That's not true in California. You could have a CBD only product, although most do have some THC because they're still typically derived by a cannabis plant. So um, it's definitely going to be growing as people get more educated around how to use this. I think as a, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a couple of reports I, in the last few months just around alcohol sales and how alcohol sales are declining kind of in our country, beer sales in particular, really seeing declines and a lot of these bigger alcohol houses are trying to figure out and navigate um, how to respond to that, whether it's coming from healthier habits and people are choosing, you know, waters or other just like beverage choices. But I think, I think it's, um, I'm surprised that the cannabis story is not more present in those conversations and articles because as cannabis becomes more accepted in our society and certainly in states where it's already legal, inevitably it will cannibalize some of the alcohol sales because people are choosing that as a lifestyle instead of alcohol. But anybody who has, I think, you know, interest in this space, um, it's a really interesting one to watch. It's, you know, prohibition of our time. So it'll be, you know, kind of a uh, life cycle and change, unlike many that we will likely see. Um, and, you know, but it, it is regulation changes very quickly. And last year, before the hemp bill passes, just even with cannabis being legal in California, brands were, you know, changing every three months to try to keep up with the regulation and dispensaries to try to meet the regulation that the state was putting in place to, you know, deal with it. So I think it's um, it's still a little bit of the Wild West on both fronts and both conventional um, products trying to figure out where CBD is going to land, where the FDA is going to come out. The FDA has been clear it's still illegal, so, or they're, you know, it's not, but they also know they have to address it. So I, I think we'll see a statement from them, certainly within the next probably like six months about how they want it or expect it to be treated. But they might say you can have CBD, but it's a, it's a drug or it's a supplement. So it can only be, you know, regulated as such. Wouldn't be surprising. Um, and it can't be in, you know, normal foods. Or they could say it's a plant additive and it can be as hemp. So we're seeing a lot of brands including it as hemp oil in their products and not calling it CBD, but hemp oil uh, innately has CBD in it. So maybe then on their back end and on their web education, they're talking about CBD. So um, that's, that's how yeah, really, really interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting space. I'm sure we'll be seeing and hearing a lot more about it. Indeed. Well, we are running, um, out of time, and I do want to be able to uh, talk with the learners about um, the upcoming programs. But is there are there any last words that you'd like to share with the group? It's been so valuable chatting with you today, Brooke, and you've given us a lot of incredible insights, and I really appreciate your time today. But we'd love to um, hear any closing remarks or things that you'd like to leave us with. Well, I really appreciate the time, and thanks for all um, the participants on the site. I know it's a 
sharing your Friday morning uh, with us. So hopefully you gain some uh, interesting insights and just thank you, uh, Kathy, for the great questions. And, and it's a pleasure. I'm happy to help anyone with uh, specific questions. And I know the uh, food program will get to do that uh, coming up too. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, but thank you. Thank you so much. A wonderful day. You too. All right, everyone. So um, we, I wanted to just let you know that uh, Brooke actually mentioned digital marketing, marketing a number of times in our conversation today. And it just happens that the next session of Food Biz Plus is Food Biz Plus Digital Marketing. So we will have a digital marketing expert that we uh, work with here uh, named Steve Howard from a company called Athenite, who will be talking about various uh, digital marketing avenues and the benefits specifically for the food industry. So please uh, register for that program and join us for that session. You can go to foodbusinessschool.org and uh, get to the link to register for that free webinar for February 27th. I also want to mention our master's degree in food business that has launched uh, last fall. We are currently accepting applications for this master's program for the fall 2019 start date. It's a two-year program online primarily that is intended for people who are working professionals to take while they're working in from whatever location you're in. It's an asynchronous program. It uh, benefits anyone who is interested in starting their own business or working up in the industry and they're in, within a company looking to get into the business of food and will uh, address everything from business fundamentals and food systems to real estate, uh, marketing, operations, et cetera. So it's a, it's a wonderful comprehensive program on getting into the food business. And uh, I'm going to skip over to a, a little diagram here, which you can find on our website, which shows sort of the outline of the program. Um, the first year of the program is a core group of courses that are pertinent to everyone, um, including ethical leadership, design thinking for food, and uh, as I mentioned, business fundamentals and food systems. And then the second year has two optional tracks if you're interested in going into a food service business like a restaurant or any other type of food service business, you could choose a track specifically focused on that. Or if you're interested in launching a food product, the second year is very, there's an option of food product, consumer packaged goods um, track where everything is specifically related to launching a product in the food business. The, throughout the program, you'll be developing a business playbook, which will be your capstone project presented to a group of faculty and potential investors, as well as industry professionals. So this is um, a very, very new program uh, in, in our world. It's like an MBA specifically directed to the food industry for food businesses. We would welcome you to apply. If you go to foodbusinessschool.org, there's a direct link to the site with more information about this program and the application process. You can also go to ciachef.edu forward slash masters and get to uh, the webpage for the program with all the information. Also feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have. My email address is kathy at foodbusinessschool.org. Happy to answer questions about uh, Food Biz Plus or our master's degree or any other programs that we may have. Thank you again for joining me today with our conversation with Brooke. I hope you found it valuable and I'll look forward to hopefully seeing you at our next uh, Food Biz Plus digital marketing on February 27th. Have a wonderful weekend.